Hello and welcome to this podcast episode, episode 16, where I talk about my thoughts on the DJI Pocket after a week. So coming up in this episode, I'm going to talk all about the DJI Pocket 3. I'm going to do a quick review of the videos I've made this week, and I'm going to answer some of the comments and questions people have asked me about the DJI Pocket 3. So let's talk about the Pocket 3. I've had it now for a week. I got it very close to the date it came out, uh, maybe a day after it came out. It was a surprise to me when it came out. I wasn't expecting it. I thought I'd be using the Pocket 2 for a very long time, but it's in, in short, it's great. It's really, really good. I paid for it with my own money. I don't even know my channel exists, so they're not going to reach out and offer me anything. But I think it's really an interesting camera because it's small and it punches above its weight in terms of image quality. So it's not any more like an action camera. It has a shallow enough depth of field that it looks like a proper, proper camera. I feel it's a step up from a smartphone. It's not maybe as convenient as a smartphone and it's not as rugged as an action camera, but I think it's better than all those as well. Now, interestingly, I have the Sony ZV-1 and the Sony ZV-1 has very good image quality, has very good focusing, it does have a shallow depth of field. It's not on par with a full frame camera, but it is small and you can put it in your pocket. It's got good audio. It's got all those things, but it doesn't have very good image stabilization. When you walk with it, it jitters and it has a good zoom range and again that's something most of the cameras i've talked about don't have so the pocket 3 your smartphone and your action cameras they don't have good optical zoom they might have multiple lenses in the case of a smartphone but you can't get a zooming in and a zooming out so if we think about a camcorder the pocket 3 is more like a camcorder than it is an action camera a smartphone etc because you press a button, it turns on and you record things and you can leave it in auto and it does enough of a good job in auto that you don't really need to put it in manual. In fact, I haven't put it in manual yet. I haven't needed to. And part of the reason for that is there are any ND filters readily available. So I've had a look at ND filters for the Pocket 3. One of the questions I had was can I use my Pocket 2 ND filters and accessories? No, you can't because the actual camera part of the Pocket 3, the gimbalized part, the lens is much bigger. So the Pocket 2 ones or the Pocket 1 won't work on it. So if I wanted to shoot at 1 50th of a second or 1 60th of a second, I'd need ND filters. And yes, you can buy them. You can buy them on DJI, and yes, you can buy them on Amazon's website, but on DJI, I'd get stung with a delivery fee, so I'm not thrilled to do that or buy it through that mechanism, and they'd also take a long time to arrive. On Amazon, they're not going to arrive for three or four weeks. That's the estimated arrival time, three or four weeks. As a side note, I found it quite annoying searching for stuff on the Pocket 3, because when you search for stuff on the Pocket 3, DJI Osmo Pocket 3 hyphen axis gimbal always comes up in the search results. A little bit annoying. I've gone off. I've gone off on a tangent there telling you about that. So I haven't filmed in manual, whereas on the Pocket 2, I would put it in 1 50th, 1 60th of a second, and I put an ND filter on, and I would completely do it in manual on the Pocket 2. But I haven't done any manual on the Pocket 3. And you know what? I don't think I need to. It looks it looks really good footage without having to worry about, oh, it's on auto, it's not going to be very good. It looks absolutely great. So the stabilization is good because it's a gimbal. And what I really like is that this shallow depth of field makes it look like a much better camera or much more expensive camera. And then it will focus really well. So I leave it in continuous focus. If I hold something up, it focuses on it. If I put it close to something, it focuses on it. And then it just goes back to focusing on the background. And the transition in focusing is nice and smooth. It's not jarring. It doesn't hunt around and it doesn't take ages to kick in. It's just really useful. With the Pocket 2, you needed really to plug it into your phone to have a decent enough screen and control it. 
With the Pocket 3, you can connect it to your phone wirelessly, but you don't need to. The screen is big enough for using as intended. So it really does become a camcorder. You turn it on, you press record. In fact, you can set it that when you turn, when you turn the touchscreen, it starts recording. Now I've actually turned that off because I find I'll turn it on by turning the touchscreen and actually I'll want to frame what I'm going to take or I want to decide whether I put an active track. So I don't want it to record straight away. And what I was finding is that when it records straight away, I instantly stop it because I'm not ready. With an action camera or like an Insta360 X3, I quite like that when you turn it on, it records straight away. So I often have that enabled on an action camera, but I've turned it off for the Pocket 3 because my shots are going to be more considered. I need to, I'm putting more thought into it. I'm not just grabbing footage. I'm doing a little bit more than that. So it's very good in low light as well, which is really surprising. So there's no electronic image stabilization that I know of. It all works off a gimbal. And it just works really well in low light. And I've done some low light tests. I was very impressed. It has a dedicated low light mode. But again, I haven't felt the need to go into that. I haven't seen a drastic difference in the low light mode. And if it doesn't need to go into that, then, well, I won't go into it. I'll just put it on the color profile I want, the sound profile or the sound setup I want and, and just film with it. I did not buy the Creator Combo Kit because it was a lot more expensive. And to be honest, at £489, I felt that was expensive enough. I didn't want to go for £619. If you're going to buy a few of the accessories and they're going to, you're going to buy DJI ones, it makes sense. It's always cheaper to buy the Combo Kit than buy things separately. I have the DJI mics anyway, and I have a few wireless microphones. And I sort of felt, well, you know what? I don't really feel the need to get a new microphone. I've got enough. And yes, the DJI Mic 2 is very good and it works with the Pocket 3 really well in that it connects really quickly. So you turn your Pocket 3 on, you've got a wireless microphone. There's nothing to plug in. It's all wireless. With the wireless microphones I have, I just have to plug them in the USB-C um, slot on the bottom. Now I've been doing that with the Action 3. I've been doing that with the Action 4 and it works fine. It's not as quick. It maybe takes five more seconds. I've experimented with changing the microphone pattern of the unit. Now the microphones on the unit are very good. Now, and if you're holding it out at arm's length, really there's not a great deal of difference between having a wireless microphone just under your chin or you know, using the inbuilt ones if you're holding it out at arm's length. If you're filming what's in front of you and not yourself, you could even hold the unit to be the same distance as you would put a lav mic. So that was one of the reasons why I didn't go for the creator kit. I'm not bothered about the wide angle lens. I probably wouldn't need the new fancy microphone because the, the stuff I record is me behind the camera and I can just hold it and it'll pick up good enough sound. And I've got wireless microphones. You don't get the mist filter, the black mist filter included in that kit anyway. You do get a battery pack, but I've got loads of USB-C battery packs. Now, I've interestingly done a video about just using cheaper accessories um, and not paying out for the combo kit. So there's that to look forward to. In fact, it's already out. So I'll talk about that in my review of the week. So like I say, you don't need the phone for this. It's really just very good. It has active tracking and I was using active track with my children. I was recording something with my children and I tracked one of them and they walked in front of each other and it lost track because one child was behind the other, but it picked it up again. So the active track is really good and you can just hold your pocket three and it will do tracking. It has limitations. Obviously it can't track. It gets to a point where the gimbal can't go any further and it will lose tracking, but the active track is very impressive. I have not used time lapse yet or hyperlapse. I haven't had a need to. I haven't had a need to film anything in slow motion, but you can get 4K up to 120 frames per second, which is going to be um, really good slow motion. You could get that down to five times slow motion if you play back at 24 frames per second. So 
it is really good and it sort of has made my ZV-1 a bit useless really. So the ZV-1 has a flip out screen. Well, I could just turn the camera on the gimbal and I could film myself and see myself on the screen. I could run it through my Mimo phone app and that would actually be better. Sony doesn't have very good apps. So it has sort of made the ZV-1 a bit redundant. I might do a video in the future comparing the Pocket 3 to the ZV-1, but it's actually made a lot of my cameras redundant as well. And something I'm really looking forward to with the Pocket 3 is getting an anamorphic adapter. So I've got the anamorphic adapters for the Pocket 2. I really like them, particularly with built-in ND. It does really, I think, elevate that footage and give it a nice wider aspect. And I think it will be really good if we can get an anamorphic anamorphic adapter for the pocket 3 unfortunately with the pocket 2 you because you don't get a shallow depth of field it just doesn't quite look right if you want cinematic you do need a shallow depth of field it is nice to have anamorphic lenses and so on my micro four thirds camera i have an anamorphic lens and that looks really really good so who is the pocket 3 for well i think it's for everyone because it's easy to use the footage is great and you can do so much with it. And it really means I'm gonna be leaving quite a lot of my cameras at home. But if you want to go skiing or do something slightly adventurous or do something in the rain, it's not for you. I took it out and I put it in my pocket and I was sort of out doing some physical stuff. I was walking really fast and it got some condensation on and I was a little bit worried about that. So if you're thinking of doing anything remotely near water, remotely having action in its title or anything, this isn't for you. So I think I've said enough about the Pocket 3. Can't love it so much. Let's move on to looking at some other things. So these are the videos I made this week. So you can see I've been quite busy this week and I've got some more things on um, on the backlog so to speak so i made a video about voice to content now voice to content is a website and it allows you to either upload videos or upload audio or record audio and then ai transcribes what you've said and then ai converts that into content ideas it cost me 15 dollars it's okay, it runs on a credit system, so eventually you're gonna run out of credits. And because it transcribes and then does some content, you end up using two credits per thing. So I don't know, useful, but it has a short life. Anyway, I mean, you can check all these videos out. They're on my channel and I'll put some links below for them as well. Obviously, I've done a non-sponsored review of the DJI Pocket 3. I also got the Anchor 533, which is a really powerful USB-C power pack. And it gives out up to 30 watts of USB-C power. So you can charge laptops, hydrain devices, etc. Great for a Pocket 3. The only downside I found to it was it is slow to charge up. And something like the Pocket 3 charges really, really quickly. It has fast charging, which is something I forgot to mention. So I also made a video comparing the Anker 533 to the legendary Anker 737. I went outside and I did some DJI Pocket 3 low light tests in low light. I made a video about something called VidPal AI, which promises to make whiteboard videos with AI and save you loads of effort. I'll let you watch the video to decide if it actually does that. And then as I was talking about earlier, I made a video about not buying the creator combo kits and maybe just buying a few cheaper accessories so in the thumbnail there you can see the pocket 3 you can see a usb-c charger although actually i think i put the one in for lightning and which was a mistake and you can see some wireless mic sets now interestingly if you get the combo kit you only get one microphone so if you're doing an interview you're going to need to get another one so what are people asking me about the Pocket 3? So I'm going to read things out and I'm going to talk about my answer. They may differ from the answer I've given in the comments um, just because time has moved on and I'm not referencing what I put in the comments. So please don't um, be annoyed if it's different from what I've said. Top one, how do you feel the screen? How do you feel the screen rotating mechanism? 
Does it feel durable? And just for sake of curiosity, how did you manage to scratch the gimbal support? Was the camera in the case? So I think the screen rotating mechanism is durable. I don't have any concerns about it. I don't think, oh, I've got to be careful with this. It's going to break. You could break it by pushing it the wrong way and being quite forceful, but it's obvious which way it goes. And it goes clockwise to open and anti-clockwise to turn. And I did scratch it. I did scratch the gimbal. And I think that was really just putting it in and out of the case. But on that scratch, I sort of just rubbed it and it came away. So I don't think it's going to be a bit of a problem, really. These things will get scratched. And particularly if you put them in your pocket, yeah, they're going to get scratched. The case was a bit funny. When I put, when I put it in the case, it was sort of sticking out at the end. It took me ages to get it right in the case. There's a click. And for a long time, it wasn't clicking in. So the case is good, the case is tough, the case is better than the case with the Pocket 2. Can't comment on what the Pocket 1 case is like because I don't have the Pocket 1. But it did take me a while to get used to it and get it to work. And obviously if you put it in your, your pocket, you've got to worry about things like keys as well. So, And as I've already pointed out, condensation building up from your body. Next one, thank you for your review. Is it possible to lock exposure in auto mode IE, I think he means IE, by tapping the screen or is it only possible in manual mode? So if you double tap the screen or tap the screen, you activate auto tracking. So you can't do what you do on your phone, which is lock exposure by tapping because it's the Pocket 3 thinks you're trying to use the tracking feature. There is a different thing you can do. You can track at a point. So if you think about cameras and you've got like these autofocus points and on your DSLR, you could select which one you wanted to use. You can do that with the Pocket 3, but instead of selecting the autofocus point, you're selecting what stays, what, what is tracked basically. That's quite good. So you don't have to track in the center, for example. You can track upper right, um, off center and things like that. So I, I'm going to mention that as well. I want to know if it's 10 bit in all color modes and how the D log M looks in low light. So one of my videos covers what things look in low light. I think it's 10 bit in D log M and I think it's 10 bit in HLG, but I don't think it's 10 bit in normal color. And again, might have got that wrong because I'm working off memory here. Why did you use, why did you choose 24 frames per second? You know at higher shutter speeds and daylight, the motion will be juddery at that frame rate. I don't understand why anyone shooting a video, not for a film or presentation theatres, would choose the low frame rate. If you choose 60, you'll get smooth motion and sharp video, even at higher shutter speeds. The camera shoots at 4K 60 with no problem. 60p is handled by computer monitors. And unfortunately, I didn't get the end bit in my screenshot. So I hate 60 FPS stuff on YouTube because most of my YouTube watching is done on a Chromebook. And I find it's always stuttery on 60 FPS. And that's a hardware limitation of my Chromebook. So I hate 60 FPS stuff. The person is right. I chose to film at 24 because I always choose to film at 24 if I can. Sometimes I film at 30. And if you're buying the Pocket 3, I feel you're buying it because you're bothered about cinematic things or that's the assumption I've made and that was why I got it I'm bothered about making cinematic looking videos and most people are going to choose 24 frames per second for that you might choose 25 if you live in the UK or Australia or power region but most people are not going to do 30 most people are not going to do 60 fps now interestingly I recognize that I use my pocket too and I put ND filters on so I can get the 180 degree shutter rule for good motion blur and that's where your shutter speed is effectively double. So if, double your frame rate. So if you're filming at 24 frames per second, you would want your shutter speed to be one over 48th of a second. So you'd go to 1 50th. That's too bright. However, if I was filming at 60 frames per second, I could have a shutter speed of 120, 120th of a second, which would probably be dark enough outside. So yes, I could film at 60 it's a hassle then for me to remember I'm filming in 60 FPS. Quite often I might mix 
different cameras. I might do a little bit of my iPhone, a little bit on, say, the Pocket 3, mix it in with something, mix it in with a screenshot. And it just, it's difficult at 60 to do that. And then do I export it at 60 FPS? Because I, I hate 60 FPS stuff. So so I could do 60 FPS and do what I want, but I'm just going to stick with 24. It's also what I know, it's what I'm used to. And when you make a video, quite often, if you do something new and it's not what you're used to, you'll make a mistake because you'll proceed as though you're doing what you're used to. So if I do it at 60, I'll probably edit it as though I was editing a 24 FPS thing and I'll make a mistake. So there's a very long answer as to why I chose 24 frames per second. How do you think the video quality with Action 4, can you compare them? Yes, of course you can compare them. You can compare anything. The Action 4, almost, it feels like it has the same sensor. I know it doesn't have the same sensor. Both record in D-Log-M, so you can record both and get a consistent image and you can grade them and color them in a consistent way. The Action 4 is wider, even on the narrow setting. Everything is in focus and it doesn't really have any focusing because it's an action camera. The Pocket 4 is not on the Pocket 4, on the Pocket 4, on the Pocket 3, it has shallower focus. So some things will be in focus and some things will be blurred and it can change focus. It's a little, it's not as wide and it looks better because it's a bigger sensor. Some things aren't in focus and are blurred, but really it's comparable in colors and, and things like that. So they're not Apples for apples because one is waterproof and one isn't. One is small enough to really fit in your pocket and one is just about fitting in your pocket. So they're not apples to apples. It depends what you want to use them for. And obviously one costs more than the other. And actually, if you're going to get the Action 4, you could probably pick up the Action 3 for quite cheap now. You can pick up the Action 3 for £259 on Amazon. I've seen it for. So you don't need the 4. You could get away with the 3. It'd be almost as good. So there's that to think about as well. So like I say, they're not apples for apples, but I'm happy I've explained the differences as I see them. So that is the podcast episode. That's the Pocket 3. It's interesting to see what people are asking about it. And I hope I've helped and I've answered that. And I've got loads of videos on the Pocket 3. So have other people. You don't have to watch mine. But I thank you for listening or watching this podcast episode. Thank you. Goodbye.